Train the muscles, not the joints. Welcome back to Natural Glands Bodybuilding. Mountain. And today I'm going to talk about a bunch of subjects. What a surprise, right? A bunch of natural bodybuilding subjects. Uh, but one of the things I'm going to talk about is, uh, is that I'm going to be doing inclines again today. Okay. So sometimes you're going to find certain exercises where you go through certain uh, levels of enthusiasm. <laughs> I go through this, I go through phases. Uh, I go through phases on my diet as well. Sometimes I'll have strictly potatoes and yams for my carbs. And other times I go to some egg noodles, you know, or I'll, I'll stick to more oatmeal or, or then I'll go to sometimes higher fat and lower carb diets. Like, you know, sometimes you change things around as the body needs it, right? So you're like a uh, 007 or a Mission Impossible agent. It's almost like your mission is, if you choose to accept it, whatever the hell your body tells you <laughs> to do, you know? So as you get more in tune with what's uh, happening, uh, you start to realize that your body is in a constant flux, like this constant shifting state. So what I'm going to do with some inclines again today, it just feels right. It just feels good on the shoulders, feels good on the pecs. And, uh, and, and sometimes, you know, I'll go through several workouts where I'll stick to one exercise. The other thing that I'm noticing lately too, is that by doing walking lunges, uh, I'm feeling really good about, uh, you know, stretching out those hips and stuff. And then when I go to squat again, there's a different, different feel, you know what I'm saying? So really what my point is, is that sometimes when you do certain exercises, it affects how you experience other exercises right? Due to mind muscle connection, due to addressing flexibility issues, uh, due to uh, refining a groove with different types of movements. You may be learning to recruit different muscles that you couldn't before that assist you with other movements. So exercise variation is a uh, necessary uh, part of this path. And I, of course, I mentioned that, but, but I find that uh, you'll also have these internal moments of wisdom, okay? And these internal moments of wisdom will all of a sudden bring you enthusiasm around certain movements, but you don't know why. I mean, you could try to think it, you could try to do a YouTube search or something and find out why, you know, you're having this enthusiasm around this certain uh, exercise, but maybe it's your body telling you something. Maybe it's your body saying, Hey, this is what I need right now. Uh, this is what's going to produce the best bang for your buck. And uh, just do this for a period of time, you know? So uh, that's what I do. Sometimes I'll have uh, an obsession with a certain exercise for two, three, four workouts in a row. And then all of a sudden, bang, I, I go to something else or uh, I just go with what my body feels like it needs. And right now it feels like incline is a better movement than flat, just, just for this workout. So we'll see where this leads me in the next few workouts, right? Who knows, right? But I'm, I'm going to do this and I'm going to address a comment that was made on my Rumble channel. Uh, and this guy said, hey, he's been told by some sort of YouTuber, you know, and this guy's uh, integrity is questionable, this, this YouTuber, but I'm not going to mention any names. But he said, well, you know, if you're just thinking about strength, just do the shoulder press, just do the, the, the standing shoulder press, and that's all that matters. Well, uh, that might be all that matters when it comes down to shoulder pressing above your head. And I'm sure that there is some upper chest involved in that. But there's no point to just diminishing your results in natural bodybuilding by just sticking to one movement if perhaps there's some gains to be had from doing another movement as well. So we know that when you're doing flat bench, for instance, you are recruiting some different muscle groups than you are recruiting when you're doing shoulder presses. So why would you avoid that? I mean, if you don't care about chest development, then I would say, okay, no problem, just stick to the shoulder presses. But if you do care about some chest development, uh, then I would say, yeah, definitely stick to some flat or at least incline presses if you want some chest development and then, you know, throw in shoulder presses as part of your shoulder routine or your strength routine or whatever you want to call it, right? Whatever the YouTubers are branding it as now, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, be careful about limiting yourself when it comes down to uh, various angles of attack. Uh, the only time I'd say for sure limit yourself is if a certain angle of attack is injuring you or causing harm. But, but anyway, the, the, actually, you know what? I was going to say something about the subject after I did the set, but I just, I just said it. So, whoops. All right, let's do some warm ups. I'll do some warm ups with 70 pounders and then uh, move on to the next level of weight.
the lightweight felt pretty good. Just the 70 pounders, just to, just to squeeze it and stuff. You know, this is the other thing. You're gonna go through phases when it comes down to weight that you use. Uh, sometimes you're gonna go through your heavyweight phase and then you're gonna go through some phases where you, you feel like training lighter and just getting that squeeze or that pump. Um, again, that's the body talking to you again, right? <laughs> the body's talking to you. And uh, you know, if you listen to it, sometimes it, it gives you some pretty big rewards, right? So, you know, the, the thing is, is that uh, a lot of times, you know, pe people think that they can template themselves into results, right? They, they, they can come up with some idealism based on something they saw on the internet. Uh, but again, I, I keep saying this, you have to feel yourself through it. And uh, the, the better you get at this process, uh, the more results you will get. And, and you'll start to notice that a lot of things that you experience contradict a lot of the BS that's said on the internet, right? So I, I just had some stupid comment just the other day, because I always get a series of them. And this guy's saying that it's been debunked that if you do an arm curl and you bring your arms forward like this, that you use any front delt. But you use a lot of front delt, especially depending on where the attachments are in the bicep. And I've always felt this, right? The front delts do lift the arm like this. There is involvement in the front delt, which is why people do front delt raises, right? You know, it's, it's not like the bicep in, and the delt are exclusive. I mean, it's not like when I do an arm curl and bring the elbows forward that I don't involve some bicep. Of course I do, but you definitely involve a lot of bicep or a lot of shoulder. So if you're getting a massive shoulder burn and your shoulders are going to failure before your biceps, you're not necessarily doing yourself any uh, justice to bicep growth, maybe to sh shoulder growth, but not to bicep growth. So this is the thing. So when people start talking shit on the internet and saying things, but I'm experiencing something different, I, I know who to trust, right? I trust this, you know, this thing right here, this, this national champion sort of thing, this thing that I, you know, followed and, and won titles with. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do is, is to learn how to talk to that body. That, that's the most important thing because a lot of people are going to say a lot of things, but you can check with your own body and find out whether that's true or not based on the results you get, of course, you know, so that way you're not delusional because if you're not getting results, then maybe there's some delusion there, right? Uh, but you start to learn how to listen to this and see what's producing results and you start to collapse the sensation that's going on in the body based on your diet and your exercise and the result and you start to match them together. And once you know what sensation leads to the result, then you can very easily determine what type of training is right for you. let's get into why some of you guys are probably clicking on this video, some of you, anyway. So um, I'm gonna answer basically how I feel like I'm putting on, you know, a bit of muscle or getting more pumpy and lumpy lately at 50 years old. Now, for people who don't know me and people that are new here, I am drug-free, I am hormone-free, I don't believe in the use of testosterone replacement therapy or any of that crap, right? I'm 100% drug-free, natural bodybuilder. I don't use any of that stuff. I never have in my entire life, okay? And how I'm putting on muscle right now, and, and this is the one thing that I find a lot of guys that are, you know, in their 30s, 40s, or even guys in their 20s, you know, a big mistake that they make is they get obsessed with starving the body, and from doing so, they end up starving off their muscle and therefore losing their metabolism. So, instead of getting into the whole approach to bodybuilding and to body shaping as a destruction of fat scenario, I highly recommend that you look at it as a way of nourishing the muscles. And the muscles use protein, they use glycogen, and yes, you need your vitamins and minerals, 
which are very important, right? I've talked about minerals, but watch my video on minerals. That's important, like calcium, magnesium, all these minerals. Uh, that's why I also eat organ meat, right? Okay. But you have to make sure that you're feeding the muscles, not just starving the body because you want to drop a pound or two of body fat. If you do this, what will happen is that usually your body will eat the muscle first and then eat the fat after because fat burns really slow. You know what I'm saying? So you're better off feeding the body good quality carbohydrates and protein mixed together in a meal, just like they used to say back in old school days, you know, and you can mix some green in there as well, like some broccoli or something and eat that throughout the day uh, or you know oatmeal and egg whites is what I do in the morning with some blueberries blueberries help stabilize blood sugar and so forth right and you're better off doing four or five meals a day like that making sure your protein is around a gram per pound of body weight and then from there seeing what's going on with your body over a period of two or three weeks as you work out and if you start to notice that you're putting on a lot of body fat well then yes uh, you need to cut the fat back a little bit or cut the carbs back a little bit. So I'm not saying to not have any fat in your diet either. Just, just so you know, that's my disclaimer. You need fat for essential processes in the physical body. So how much fat is up for debate depending on the person. But if you're using starches as your primary fuel source, you can get away with only 30, 40, 50 grams of fat a day uh, and, and, and see what happens from there. But I find a lot of times... People will put 100 grams of fat or 150 grams of fat into their body and wonder why they're not burning off fat. Well, it's because you're replacing so much with uh, such a large amount of fat fuel. And you don't really need that much fat. To be a bodybuilder, you don't need a ton of fat. You know what I'm saying? So you just need enough for the body to use it for its essential processes. But primarily, you are a protein and glycogen machine. That's how muscles work. So um, that's how I'm doing it. I, I'm eating my oatmeal in the morning. I'm eating my chicken and potato regularly through the day or, or yam or liver. I have liver and ground beef with mashed potato as well. And, and these are the types of foods that I'm eating. And I eat about four or five meals a day. And then I also have some branch chain amino acids or essential amino acids during my workout. So I have a good essential amino acid uh, type of drink that I drink. And, and that's basically working. Like I'm getting a really good pump from it and really good uh, level of well-being, right? Now, if you want to experiment with herbs and things like ashwagandha and, uh, uh, you know, take, take zinc supplements, because like I said, zinc is also a mineral, you know, uh, these are all, all great things to experiment with and see how they work for you. But the foundation of your diet is so important in making sure that you're getting enough protein and energy food to feed that muscle and therefore uh, the muscle starts to grow and therefore your metabolism goes up and then the skimming off the body fat becomes part of a residual return, right? It, it comes over the long run of increasing that metabolism and therefore being able to, uh, you know, burn energy by using the muscle and that sort, sort of thing. So that's always worked better for me. And I've tried lots of different diets. When I start to go like really low carb, high fat or medium fat with protein and stuff, my muscles start to take on a flat appearance and I start to look more fat and flat right? It, it doesn't seem to work as well. Although uh, I, I feel okay and I still feel like I recover, but I'm not necessarily uh, as bodybuilderish in the look from eating that way. So um, the one thing you're going to find is you're going to find all sorts of conflicting information that you have to go carnivore. Or you got to do this. You got to do that to be healthy. And I'm going to say that's not necessarily true, uh, but you do always want to take in your own personal circumstance, depending on what's going on with you and your life and your health and, and so forth. So uh, I am open to the fact that certain diets will maybe produce better returns in people at certain periods of time in their life. And sometimes it could be based on certain sort of uh, uh, issues that a person may be having, right? So for instance, say somebody is mildly diabetic. Well, maybe starches and, and stuff present a problem for them. You know, maybe having too much of that stuff can create a problem. So yeah, so barring all that aside, this is what I'm doing. And I'm also doing uh, basically a three-day split program. So my workout looks like this. It's uh, like the two-day split programs on my website. That's what it looks like, uh, where I do, you know, three to five sets per body part uh, every second day. And then once in a while, I'll throw in a whole body workout. So I have whole body workout programs as well on my website. So I'll throw in a whole body workout. And then I'll take about one to two days off a week. One to two, depending on how I feel. So, yeah, this, this is how I'm doing it. All right. So let's get into a 100 pound dumbbell set. Let's go for another set.
One thing that will help you, help you get more results in the long run is, is something I have mentioned before, and that's chasing the well-being in the body. Like chasing that overall feeling, right? That pump, that, uh, that uh, let's just say that, that feeling of vitality that runs through the muscle tissue. And uh, that will guide you uh, whether you're eating enough food or not, right? That, that, that should be there. And, and a lot of people think that if they are going through absolute misery and feeling starved all the time, you know, uh, that, that they're somehow going to get better results. Now, I'm not saying that you won't have cravings for junk food here and there. And, and you know, we, it's kind of like balancing on the blade of a knife, right? You, you don't want to be just following your urges. But once you find the difference between an urge, like an addiction to shitty food, and, and the difference between feeling what your body wants, uh, then you'll be able to make the right choices, right? You're, you're not going to just be following your whims, but you'll be following truth in the body. So as you're venturing upon this path, you're refining your ability to find truth in the physical body. And that will guide you. And unfortunately, a lot of people that are out of alignment with some truth you know, because because we're all at different levels. You know, all of us are at different levels of truth in our physical systems, right? And one could argue it's a constant evolution. There's always another level to learn. But if somebody's really out of balance, uh, they're going to be intellectualizing everything and trying to follow some sort of template that way. But they can't trust their instincts. They can't trust their sensations, right? Because all their sensations they're doing is is telling them to. Uh, do something dysfunctional based on their emotional or mental or physical suffering, right? But as that becomes purified, as you continually not follow the whims, like the urges for addictive behavior, like just eating junk food for the sake of it all the time, what will happen is that your body will start to give you, uh, let's just say, a pure thread of information where then it will start to say, no, no, I, I, you do need ice cream today or some sort of sugar or some sort of calorie influx and that will lead you to better results and and feeling better overall right maybe there's some nutrient in the ice cream that the body's in tune with that it needs but what i'm trying to say is that your urges become purified when you don't follow them superficially they become let's just say more in alignment with your health because you're bridging how the body feels with the following of certain urges and you're bridging the gap between the two. So you're, you're finding the happy medium somehow. And, and that will be a deeper level of truth. I hope this wasn't too deep of a message for you guys. I'm trusting that some of you are able to follow what I'm saying, but yeah, there's a difference between following superficial urges and then following the truth of the body. That's all I'm saying. And it will become more and more refined as you go along in this journey. So sometimes if you're not getting results in a certain area, it could be you have a weak link that needs to be addressed. So uh, a common weak link example would be uh, the external rotator cuff muscles when it comes down to your pressing movements, right? If your rotator cuff muscles are weak or are overburdened, what will happen is that you will not be able to recruit the major muscle groups such as the pecs as well. So I learned this the hard way based on my shoulder dislocation uh, because what happens is the shoulders need to engage way more just to keep the shoulder in the joint. And if those muscles are experiencing an overload, it will be harder for them to address uh, putting tension on the major muscle group. So case in point, if you're having trouble putting muscle on in a certain major muscle group, perhaps there is an auxiliary muscle a muscle that assists with the process that needs to come up first. And this is where I'm going with this. I'm going to do some external rotator cuff exercises with super lightweight on the incline here. I do a pretty shallow incline and I'm going to do external rotation and get a nice burn. Now the double benefit of this 
is that when you strengthen up those rotator cuff muscles, not only is your press going to be more stable and your groove going to be better when you are bench pressing, but at the same time, you're going to be building the rotator cuff muscles that actually slide underneath the delt, which helps give you that soft ball look in the deltoids. And that's what everybody's after. They want that big balloony type of look in the, in the delts. Well, the external rotator cuff exercises will assist with giving you that look as well as rehabilitating injuries and helping you keep your shoulder free from injury and pain. So a lot of times the secret to getting big delts is missed by a lot of people uh, because they get focused on the front delt so much, not remembering that they're using a lot of front delts when they do bench presses or inclines. So a lot of times the secret to great results is working on those areas that are not being stimulated, right? And never has there been an area so understimulated as the rear delt. Uh, because often when people are doing back training, their biceps or their back is taking the majority of the stress. And unless of course you're rotating around the bar when you're doing chin-ups or really uh, trying to uh, pull the bar in a way that you're just basically rotating the shoulders instead of engaging the lats, uh, your rear delts are not necessarily going to get hit as much or um, they may lag behind. So. One thing that I, I think that a lot of people could benefit from if they want to increase delt size is to look at their delts and honestly assess, is there, are their rear delts much smaller than the front? And if they are, I definitely recommend rotator cuff work as well as rear delt work, like bend over lateral raises like I'm gonna do right here. You can either do them bent over or you can do them uh, chest supported on an incline. I go back and forth depending on what I feel like doing. and really by using those rear delts more often you're going to balance out the physique and it's going to make it look much more balanced as well as uh, more pumpy and lumpy right more picturesque right so the more lumps you got the better you know uh, but but the fact is is that you want to make sure that the back is as strong as the front and therefore you're going to reduce injuries and also get more development Now, like I said, I do two variations of this. Sometimes I do the bent over row just from the waist, like standing, and then sometimes I'll use chest support. It sometimes just depends on whatever mood I'm in or if my lower back just feels tired from doing a lot of Romanian deadlifts or squats. But the important thing to realize is that I'm externally rotating on purpose because I'm trying to include that external rotator cuff because I understand the value of working that muscle just for rehabilitation reasons along with the fact that it contributes to the overall size of the rear delt.
Now, just because I'm doing external rotator cuff uh, exercises along with the bent over lateral raise, right? So I'm kind of combining a hybrid sort of uh, movement together. Doesn't mean that I don't do uh, actual specific rear delt work, which you'll see right here. See, I'm going into the skier motion and I'm careful to rotate around the shoulder joint. So I'm not depressing the shoulders in order to gauge engage the lats what i'm doing is i'm actually allowing the pure rotation around the shoulder joint to hit that rear delt more specifically now i'm going to do some back now of course usually doing chest then rear delts then back again is kind of a funny order right uh, but I do get a lot of benefit from changing up the order of the exercises. And yeah, that my delts are going to be burning from doing this. And it'll force me to try to recruit the back more than the delts. But uh, yeah, even just leaning up on the bar right now, just leaning here, I can feel my rear delts burning. So, uh, but, but you know, the thing is, is that, again, this is how the inspiration works. Sometimes you're inspired to do things a certain way. And it's okay to break your templates. Uh, as long as you're exhausting that muscle within the anaerobic window, which is, you know, around anywhere from 10 seconds to a couple minutes to, to hit exhaustion in the muscle itself. And it's not cardio exhaustion, but it's actually muscular exhaustion. You are going to be stimulating some sort of growth or strength, endurance or strength, you know? So yeah, sometimes by playing with these different types of rhythms in your training, you can uh, produce some unexpected results or make some unexpected discoveries. And that's actually part of the fun, right? It's it's like you're the Indiana Jones of lifting weights and you're uh, trying to discover the, ne the next relic, the next, you know, massive discovery that's going to unleash your mystical power of natural bodybuilding. So yeah, let's do some bent over rows. And uh, yeah, I'll do this for a few sets and see what happens. My delts are burning. Yes, they are. They're burning. One thing you're going to notice is that when you play around with your diet, you're going to notice that there are times where you eat certain foods or certain macros and you experience a certain type of a pump in the gym or, or a lack thereof, or you feel like your performance goes down and stuff. But then there'll be some times where you really notice that the food helps with you having a better mind muscle connection. You're better able to investigate the subtleties of the muscle based on the food. I know it sounds weird, but when the energy is properly working in the muscles, when the muscles have enough glycogen, there is a better ability to connect to the muscles. And the funny thing is I noticed when I was competing that sometimes I would eat, uh, you know, more fat foods and stuff and, and crappy foods in the off season. And what would happen is, I would have not as good a mind muscle connection with the muscles. So I started to clean up my diet in the off season and noticed more mind muscle connection and better pumps and my body started to look better, right? So more calories are just more food, but if it's the wrong type of food, it can work against you. You know, as much as some guys talk about just bulking and you know, there's all obviously the strength competitors, right? The strong man competitors. Those guys are just trying to be like sumo wrestlers, so they have a lot of body weight to throw around. And, and yes, they can put on strength, but the goal is not necessarily mind-muscle connection or to have a uh, certain amount of hypertrophy. Their goal is to create as much like muscle and fat and everything together so they have better stability in their core to be able to lift that heavy weight over their head, right? But that said, I found when I tried to eat like that, it actually worked against me. So you're gonna to have to experiment a bit, but I, I remember telling somebody this, that was a, you know, an up and coming natural bodybuilder, and they noticed the same thing when they would diet down for competition, or at least clean up their diet a bit, 
they had better mind-muscle connection with their muscles and they were able to actually get a better pump and it looked like they were getting better results overall in the long run in the actual muscular development because they weren't overburdening their system with a bucket load of fat and sugar all the time, right? So yeah, you have to find that happy balance, but I'm, I'm feeling great doing these rows today. It just feels like really just great pump, you know? And uh, yeah, that's, that's the thing. If you can increase the well-being during your training, it will increase your motivation and increase your enjoyment. And yeah, that's, that's a win-win situation, you know what I'm saying? So that's all I gotta say for today. I hope this helps you out in your training, guys. Thanks a lot for watching. If you need to get a hold of me, just go to naturalgalantbodybuilding.com and thanks to the Patreon supporters. And take care for now. Mountain. That's right, mountain. That's what I said.